The next up we have Rachel McClue, is a visual designer at Goodsmiths.com, the marketplace for makers. After hours, she practices yoga and follows what's new and amazing in the tech world. Please welcome Rachel. artifacts from the mid-20th century. But the reality is people have been using images for thousands of years. Hieroglyphics were not the first written language, but they're a notable one because they conveyed the idea that an image could represent something greater than itself. It could be a symbol. The tradition of recording <coughs> history by hand uh, continued throughout the early Christian era with illuminated manuscripts. Done by scribes and by hand, they were very painstakingly uh, using geometric forms to illuminate these different passages, primarily you know, holy books. It wasn't until the invention of the printing press that knowledge became more widely available. We often think of the printing press as being an overnight success, but the reality was it was over 10 years in development, and it also required um, new achievements in both metal type making and paper making to work well. It's interesting to note that some of the first typefaces used on the printing press were German black letter and umschels, which are sort of a, a script based on the handwritten illuminated manuscripts. Nicholas Jensen recognized that there was a usability problem with this, and he designed what's known as Jensen, the first serif typeface, which set the standard in type for years to come. But without uh, images, type doesn't have as much impact. Uh, Joseph Neeps took the very first photograph. It took almost eight hours of exposure to create a very low resolution and kind of grainy at first. But even so, the use of machines continue to transform the way that we approach things. This is the Portland base. It looks like a Greek artifact or antique, but it's actually one of the first mass-produced goods uh, created by Josiah Wedgwood and Company. With the idea of mass production came factory labor and a lot of discussions around the separation of the maker from the product. One of the proponents of mass production was William Morris, and he's considered the founder of the arts and crafts movement. He held to the notion that you could still make things by hand and making them meaningful. He is well known for his wallpaper and other artistic patterns. At the same time, commercial art was becoming more popular and the idea of using imagery and kind of creating a brand around your product. Now you wouldn't know it, but this is actually an advertisement for Bagnolet soap, and it was done by the artist Alphonse Mucha. It may also be kind of considered one of the early examples of using sex to sell in advertising. At this time, a lot of the typefaces and type treatments being used were sort of exemplary of the Victorian era. There was a lot of emotion, and they were combining different types of all different kinds of treatments just to make this big visual impact. And to us today, it tends to feel a little chaotic and disorganized because we've been influenced by modernist principles. The Cubists were some of the first artists to really think about the idea of abstraction and not representing a scene in nature as it actually was, but thinking about shapes and objects in the picture plane. And this idea really transformed the way that we approach art and design. The Bauhaus was one of the most notable schools of art and design in the early 20th century and founded in Germany in the 1920s. A lot of the exercises that they developed for students are still used today. And with the advent of World War II, a number of the founders and students of the Bauhaus ended up moving to the United States. Some of the most notable um, post-World War II graphic design done in America um, was to kind of further different social causes Lester Beale is a notable mid-century designer. He explored a lot of ideas using um, European avant-garde techniques and combining uh, images with other graphic treatment. It wasn't all glamorous, however. Uh, it was long before computers were invented, and preparing your artwork for print meant a laborious process of kind of cutting and pasting together the different pieces and being very exact and precise. At the same time, there were a number of exciting developments, particularly in the area of typography. Uh, people recognized that the old Victorian typefaces and the serif typeface weren't necessarily the best way to represent these new rational scientific um, principles. This is Univer, a typeface developed by Jan Treschel. 
and it came in a number of different ways, so it was really suitable across the grid um, for a number of applications. Another tool used by graphic designers was the grid, popularized by Joseph Mueller Brockman. It was kind of a system for laying out information and could be used in books and magazines and catalogs, and even today um, it's used widely in web design as well. With any growing profession, I think the question of ethics tends to be raised. This is First Things First, a manifesto published in the 1960s and signed by over 400 designers. They asked the question, was it really important to use the towns to sell mundane things like cat food and toothpaste that people were going to buy anyway? And it's a discussion that still continues to this day. With the advent of the Apple Macintosh, uh, personal computing became a reality. It was said that they wanted the Macintosh to be as easy to use as a toaster. And computers have really come a long way from being kind of simple counting machines to now having a graphical user interface and having applications beyond just simple word processing. One of the first uh, computer art programs developed was Adobe Illustrator. And it's known for its use of Bezier curves. And when they were introducing the application, they wanted to harken back to fine art traditions and the idea that the computer is just another tool to create things. The web has also transformed uh, the way that we approach design. And in the span of a few short years, we've gone from thinking about designing for a 256 uh, color web safe palette to thinking about designing across multiple devices and um, different ways that people might experience the web. I think the question, what does the future hold for design, is hard to answer. Uh, some of the things that are being discussed today are how do we use typography on the web and what's a responsible way to do it with more options becoming available? And what is the future role of print design in a society that is increasingly digital? Thank you so much.